Welcome, everybody. Welcome back to Monaco and the RM Sotheby's Car Show podcast. Very glad that you can join us here. Uh, I am Peter Haynes, and I'm joined by my esteemed colleague, Michael Squire, car specialist and uh, are you chief archivist or something like that? That's very rude. Uh, <laughs> director of research. Oh, the director of research. Chief archivist. Well, this is like I sort of sit behind a desk. Director sort of, of research. In a, in a sort of That's a job somebody has and, to do. Yeah. And Michael is the man that does it. <laughs> and uh, and anyway, uh, Michael knows an awful lot more about uh, cars than I do. So we're going to be uh, relying upon him to talk some common sense during this podcast. But uh, for anyone that didn't watch the last podcast, yes, we are in Monaco. This big room that we're standing in surrounded by cars is the Grimaldi Forum. But what we're going to do, we're going to use this opportunity to just take you for a very short stroll about around uh, some of the cars in the sale. There's a bit of noise going on over here. And that's because we have some quite special simulators. You have to say simulators quite carefully, don't you? Because otherwise it's a stimulator, which is an altogether different thing. Um, although, this is not only a simulator, it is a very stimulating uh, and beautiful piece of work. Um, what I'm looking at here, I, there are actually two uh, simulators here. One is designed by Pininfarina, and the other is designed by Zigato, two of the world's most important design houses in the automotive world. Uh, and these are um, e-classic uh, products and they are extraordinarily high quality and they employ uh, really fantastic simulation technology but the whole purpose of this is to replicate the world of historic racing. Most simulators are geared towards replicating you know a contemporary rally car or formula one uh type of experience and these are sort of geared towards the historic racer and they really are lovely objects nice to just have in the room as much as anything where should we start michael what are we standing next to should we start uh actually over at the alpha tipo 33. can i just can i on our way to that mm. can i just stop in front of the daytona spider here uh bright yellow ferrari daytona spider and the thing about these cars is there aren't very many of them, are there? No. Nope. And there's something about Daytona Spiders that people just absolutely love. There's some kind of iconic type, uh, sort of cultural place that these cars um, have. Uh, and, and do you think that's got anything to do with Miami Vice, or do you think it, or, or what yeah, do you think definitely. it is? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the great thing about the Daytona Spider is that the coupe is one of the sort of best Ferrari designs. Um, they ever did and actually usually when they chop the roof off something it sort of looks all a bit incongruous it doesn't really work it's actually with the spider it just it just fantastic it things does the whole look, look like of it it looks like it was designed as yeah a absolutely a yeah coupe, and you've it? got sort of this enormous bonnet um, where they've got the 4.4 litre uh, v12 underneath so it's just they're fantastic things this car's in lovely condition yeah. um, and it's it originally went to the US it's it's since come come back to Europe um, but it's just a lovely car. And bright yellow. I mean, that's, that is a car for the Cote d'Azur, isn't it? Or, or, Mi or Miami, one or the other. But it's um, certainly a car to be seen in. Mm. But let's move on to something uh, which I know you are a particular fan of and is not for cruising around uh, coastal resorts. Uh, no. This is entirely different kettle of fish. Tell us about this. So it's a 1969 Alfa Romeo Tipo 33. Um, so Alfa Romeo back in the sort of late 60s, early 70s, you know, they were competing with the, the absolute top manufacturers World Sports Car Championship. Um, you know, this car raced against 917s, uh, Ferrari 512s, and later on, once that category became a three-lead category, um, you know, these really were at the, at the top of their game. Um, so it's, a it's a beautiful looking thing, isn't absolutely it? Absolutely stunning. For those and of you who don't have the benefits of seeing it, this is a... Um, a, w a big, wide sports car designed for events like Le Mans, the Targa Florio, those kind of, uh, you know, epic sports car events. And it's an open cockpit car. It's not, it's not a, a closed cockpit. Alpha languished for quite a long time, didn't it? it without mm. much going on in the world of motorsport and was perhaps better known for producing um, not Sort of family, fa fa yeah, fa family hatchbacks yeah. that weren't necessarily of the best quality. But but yes. if you go back in time, it was an altogether different thing, wasn't it? Yeah, Alfa absolutely. Romeo? Yeah, pre-war, Alfa Romeo was the brand. They, they were Ferrari before Ferrari. 
their sort of motorsport routes have carried on you know, properly into post-war in the mid-60s you have GTAs and stuff like this but you know these Tipo 33s you know, they used so much of motorsport know-how in them you know and they had using stuff like titanium in, in there in mm. components mm. and you know this is this wasn't just a sort of half effort, you know, it was a proper, proper works produced, works run sports racing car. You know, just fantastic things. They sound mega, you know, brilliant, brilliant cars. The thing with this car is it actually, um, it left the factory in 73. Um, and <laughs> we think it may have been a bit of a backdoor deal um, out to their Coney uh, shock absorber supplier. Um, stayed with them from 1973 to 2003. You know, often with these, they've sort of had fairly cruel lives, and they've they don't actually don't sort of stay in quite the same state as they probably yeah, left the factory yeah, as. Whereas yeah. this just stayed in one collection for 30 years, left that, and it's just remained extremely I mean, original ever since. Competition cars generally are an absolute nightmare for auction houses in terms of uh, corroborating originality and yeah. matching chassis numbers and saying, well, this chassis number won this race and that one. Run Ran that race. I mean, it's a, it's a world of pain, isn't it? In terms of getting to these are the most difficult cars for yeah. race histories. A, a lot of Tipo 33s. Um, we don't really know what they did, mm. and you know this car is. It's funny the the chassis number on it. It actually we've we've done a huge amount of research into this, and we've gone absolutely everywhere to see if we could find out what this car did. And we've you know we've, we haven't come up with the goods that we wanted. So and we've been to every single expert. And we still know no further down the road. Let's move on to. Should we have a look um, at that 507? I think, yes. Yeah. We're, let's go and talk about the BMW 507. The BMW 507 is a car which really followed on, I suppose, from the pre war BMW 328 in terms of them having a, a, an open roadster which was beautifully styled and something which was. Um, you know, really a really desirable early post-war uh, sports car that people could um, really covet ownership of, and they weren't produced in huge numbers. So when a 507 comes to market, it's always a very desirable and very valuable thing. And what's the story with this one, Michael? So this car has been in one ownership for decades, and. What's so lovely about it? It's all original interior. Yeah, it's amazing it's, the interior, isn't it? So many 507s, their engines are, should we say, restamped, or maybe not don't have their original engine. This one is like got absolute all the numbers where you want them. Engine number is absolutely right. You know, it's it's a real lesson. And, of it, a car. and it's an absolute. It's a sort of a t terrific dark grey metallic with a contrasting. Uh, sort of oxblood red interior, and um, the, the, I mean the thing about the interior is that it's um, so frequently with valuable cars that have gone through restoration. When you look at the interior, it, it basically looks brand new. It looks, you know, showroom fresh, and the seats don't look like they've been sat on, and the steering wheel doesn't look like it's ever been held. You look in this car, and you're looking at leather with cracks and creases, and in fact, so there's a a small tear down on the driver's seat. I mean, th this is a car that has been sat in and driven and loved and used. And really, that's how cars should be presented, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. The cars, yeah. cars should speak to their age. Yeah. And, and that's, this does exactly that. And of course, the, uh, the BMW 507 has a terrific V8 engine as well. So it's got, it's got go as well as show. Um, should we look at the highlight car of the sale? I think we ought to look at the GMA. highlight cars. We're going to walk past this wonderful Fiat 600 Jolly, which if you lived in Monaco or down the road in Saint-Tropez or Nice or somewhere, I think this would be a really very nice car to own. You've got this sort of flimsy canvas top that will unpop and it's um, wickerwork seats and really desirable little car. Mm. Really lovely. This was, uh, wasn't bought new by Agnelli, but it was bought later on by Agnelli for his secretary. Uh, Agnelli I'm, being I'm, the boss of the Fiat Empire, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm not going to say anything more about Agnelli buying his secretary a very nice Fiat Jolly. Um, <laughs> they may have been close. They may, they may, they may been have been close. Friendly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> terrific though. It's a um, terrific thing. And oh, I'd so, love one of those. Yeah, and they, they, it's quite rare that you come across ones which have got absolutely cast iron history from you. You know, yeah. you get the um, Chronologico Strato, um, and on there you can see it went to gear, became a jolly. Whereas quite a few cars, you can't get that kind of history. You're not quite sure whether it's the right right thing or not. 
and this of is course, an absolute cast iron car. And it's a 600, car. not a 500, which means you've got a whole extra 100cc. Which makes a huge difference. Which is going <laughs> to at least get it moving. Uh, uh, so uh, here we are. So um, this is the Ferrari 340 MM, a Vignali Spider, and there are only four known Vignali spiders in existence of the 10 340 mm's produced so it's a very rare thing indeed isn't it Michael? Yeah these, these are great things this was the sort of brutish sorry most brutish Ferrari you could buy at the time um, comes with its original engine on the side has a really interesting engine installed in it a really early 340 engine and uh, but the the rest of the car, body's entirely original. It's been, it was with uh, one very, very well-known and uh, well-regarded collection in America for a long time. Um, so it's, yeah, it's just a lovely thing. And the thing that I love about these early Ferraris, especially Vignali's, you know, there's a styling here, which is just, you just do not get with any other era of, of, of cars. It's so no, and, and utterly the, 50s. The, 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 and it's such an influential design, isn't it? Because if you think of a car like an AC Ace, for example, you're, you're sort of seeing a car, uh, and ultimately, I suppose, to some degree, a Cobra, if you take that as the evolution of the Ace, yeah, you can absolutely see where the, um, uh, the design philosophy came from. Uh, it's probably a little bit churlish to suggest that a car worth six million euros is good value for money. When you actually think of the car's historical significance, the fact that the 340mm effectively won them a world championship, and the production numbers, a 340mm Vinali Spider like this has not been sold publicly for slightly over a decade. So this is sort of a once in a generation opportunity, isn't it, to acquire a car like this because yeah. there are so few of them and they come to market so rarely. So actually, even in the context of, you know, by anyone's standard, six million euros is a lot of money. Relative to the price that some cars command that are perhaps less rare, mm. it's not a bad buy, is it? No. So moving on from the Ferrari 340, we have this uh, beautiful uh, Renault 5 rally car, um, the classic. Uh, 80s mid-engined layout uh, that we all so love. So the, the lovely thing about Renault 5s is that they really bridge the gap between the Group 4 era and the Group B era. Ran in the Tour de France, did Tour de Course as well. Um, yeah, the, for me, the Tour de France really was like the event. It's the proper endurance event. It wasn't just yet another rally. You know, it was several days. Got regularity sections, circuit sections, stuff like this. This was the the, the biggest um, you know event in France apart from Le Mans, yeah. and uh, you know this car did did well in all, all of those events. Ragnotti is like the name for Renault fives. Um, there's there's no other driver who's it's a bit like Munari with with Stratasys and and Dunish. Um, you know he was he was the man for Renault fives, and, and this car was was his car. This, I believe it's actually signed by him as well. And, Another cool thing about this is it's a Turbo One. You know, you've got some of the sort of features on the dash and stuff like that, which makes, I don't know, it's for me, I mean, I love Renault 5 turbos, but it's the Turbo One that really is the, you yeah. know, that's, that's the sort of the original with the yeah. sort of quirky, more quirky features in there. Yeah, no, so, I yeah, agree. It's a, it's a really special thing, this. So we're gonna, we're gonna wander over to have a look at another car, which is a particular favorite of Michael's, but, so are you enjoying being back in Monaco, Michael? It's nice to be here, isn't it? Yeah, it's great. I mean, last time we were here was 2018. We we're supposed to be here in 2020, but um, obvious world events uh, prevented that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's great to be back. The, the, the Monaco Historic Meeting is absolutely one of the best in the world. Um, and it's, it's, it's funny, you sort of, you go away from something for four years and you slightly forget how special it is and then you come back and as soon as you arrive here, it just all comes back. It's such a fantastic place for, it, it, for all of that it, stuff. It, it, it really, really is. And um, I mean, this really is one of the, as a venue, it's probably one of the best uh, venues that we have, isn't it, in the auction calendar, just in terms of the building. The amount where we of are, the, the, yeah. where we are, the amount of space we have, um, it, t it really does tickle. We're, the we're literally a two-minute walk from Poitier Corner on the circuit, so it's yep. you know you can't get yep. much closer. And we'll we'll soon be hearing the uh, the cars on track, won't we, when they're out yep. <laughs> doing their thing? So this is a 1965 ESO A3C. The really nice thing about this car is that we think it's the last completely unrestored car. It's been resprayed in its life. Um, it was delivered near a champagne. You can actually see the original colour in the door shuts. It's, it's a lovely colour. Um, 
but the entire interior is original. Yeah, it's that exactly is, is. as it's produced. And ESOs suffer from being, should we say, recreated a bit. Um, there's a few cars which unfortunately have been invented. Um, this car is just undeniably original. Yeah. Um, it's, there's about seven or eight cars which, with their um, with a flat rear window. And the significance of that, that was the earliest design. A lot of the early competition cars um, had that and this whole sort of look with the sort of ducts there and the gills. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, it's a, it's a hugely significant and special car. And I just hope that whoever buys it, you know, yes, the old paint is lovely, but actually this should be champagne again. And they just need to leave the interior exactly as it is. And just don't, yeah. you know, and then it's a perfect preservation class car. We have an absolutely wonderful example of a Mura here. Um, for those of you who don't have the advantage of seeing it, it is um, classically finished in, uh, in red with the gold running along the sills and the gold wheels. It's, it's sort of quite an iconic um, livery for a Mura. Uh, so what can you tell us about this, Michael? So this is a really significant car. First car produced for the US. It's, it's US homologation is, is a slightly um, may have been a little bit of corruption in there. Um, they, they should have done about 50,000 miles for the emissions test and it appears that they it probably did about 1,000. Um, so you read into that what you will. Um, but it's a hugely significant car being the, the first one in. You know, for, for me, so I'm fortunate enough that my family had an SV for the best part of a decade um, and sadly no longer. Um, so every time I see one, I sort of feel hugely jealous of whoever's gonna, whoever owns it or whoever's going to end up with it. But this thing, you know, all the, when you look at it, all of the sort of panels you can tell are absolutely right. It's, uh, it's, it's never had an issue. You know, so many mirrors do, you know, they have a bit of a penchant for um, setting fire. Um, and well, it's Italian, they also, isn't it? That's yeah. right. And they also have. I had, a, not I had a Fiat X one nine once. I know what all that's about. Yeah. I mean, very comparable <laughs> car in many respects. Yeah, very. Yes. Yeah, sort of. Um, so yeah, it's it's they're not the easiest to handle. Um, their gearbox is difficult. The clutches are heavy, but there's so much that is right about them. The steering is lovely. The brakes are fantastic, and the engine is just magnificent. And the sort of enjoyment that you have driving them. It's, it's one of the few cars where that's not actually the primary reason why you don't want. You know, it's, a, it's an absolute work of art. Yeah, um, it, 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 is, it, it is a beautiful car to go. And for, the, and for the, perhaps the less geeky listeners uh, to this podcast, uh, the, the, the place that the Miura has in cultural history is, of course, it was the car that uh, you saw um, early on in the Italian job in the movie uh, of um, a very suave looking Italian guy in sunglasses driving up uh, a twisting alpine uh, road only to drive it into a tunnel and hit a JCB or a digger at least and uh, uh, and the thing explodes and gets shoved unceremoniously off the side of a cliff and uh, so for anyone that doesn't necessarily know what a Lamborghini Maria is it is the car that exploded in the Italian job which uh, is, in its own right makes them very cool don't you think? Not, not all of them ended up crashing, crashing into a JCB. Um, well, ma yeah. ma maybe it didn't crash into a JCB. Had, Perhaps it just, in fact, caught fire. Yes, but well, they had <laughs> their famous owners, you know, Miles Davies owned, owned one. Um, Rod Stewart had a couple. Rod Stewart, I think he had at least three. Did he? Yep. And uh, there's a few dictators that had one. Um, Papa Doc, mm -hmm. a lovely man. Um, and uh, yeah, so they, they were delivered all over the world, Australia, Singapore, Venezuela, places like that. So they were, you know, it's an exotic car, not just in sort of the way it was designed, but actually who it ended up with. Um, yeah, so yeah, yeah. just culturally hugely significant. And, and, and really, you know, put Lamborghini on the map, didn't it? Because, Completely. B b b because prior to that, Lamborghini started out making tractors. Um, but nothing wrong with that. Porsche have made a few tractors as well. But, um, you know, this was the car, once they start, got into sports car production, they made some really very lovely cars prior to the Miura, but the Miura was a bit of a game changer for them and I think it really got uh, Enzo Ferrari very worried. So that uh, concludes our little walk around of the Monaco sale cars, so thank you for joining us. We're going to take a short break, but we're going to be back very soon with um, ex-supermodel Jodie Kidd, who's uh, well known for being a car lover and she's out here in Monaco doing various things and we're going to find out where her love of cars started. So uh, we'll be back shortly.
Hello everybody, welcome back to part two of uh, RM Sotheby's car show. Uh, we're in Monaco and in fact, uh, a little bit earlier, it was preview time. Uh, what you might be able, you probably can't hear it actually, but through those doors there, the sale is actually going on. So we've actually had to move out of the room because if we were in there, it would be rather noisy. But um, I have managed to uh, grab for a few minutes Jodie Kidd. Very lucky to have her here, uh, model and car enthusiast. So um, Jodie, thank you for giving us 10 minutes of your time. Absolute pleasure. And we've actually... Uh, we've seen a bit of each other today, haven't we? Because we we've have been indeed. we've we've been out on a boat a bit earlier. Yes. Um, it sounds very glamorous. Which does <laughs> which, which, which does we just sound glamorous? Swan about on boats and just you know. Well, we've been with Mr. Mansell, haven't we? We have. We've we were it. doing something very very special. Uh, yes, it's been uh, it's been very very nice. Yeah. Uh, is this your first time at the Monaco Historic? Uh, no, it isn't. No, I'm I'm a complete car nut, as I think you have gathered by now. So no, this is probably my fourth or fifth time um, and uh, I, it's just magical I find coming to the F1 here is just so intense you can't move yeah. and it's just a little bit too much whereas coming to the historic is you know not only seeing the cars of my dreams race millimeters from where you're standing mm. um, but the whole kind of vibe is so beautiful I've always been such a big classic car lover um, so no for this it's it's a much more sophisticated um, kind of and uh, it is nice to see the old machinery oh, going around the, tr the, the track it's isn't it just heavenly. Uh, especially so you know the pre-war cars oh, and God, they look heavenly. fantastic honestly makes you smile I'm just smiling <laughs> so look a lot of people are obviously going to know that you had a, a long career in in modeling so, mm. but you're in recent years perhaps you've come to a, a lot of people's attention more for your love of cars and yes. for motor racing yeah but let's go back to young Jodie yeah did you were you loving cars then or or did that come later in life no it came later mm. I mean I loved I loved horses, so what yes. I wanted to do was follow my dad's footsteps and become a show jumper who was on the British team. And so um, I d was just brought up with this wonderful image of my father with these beautiful horses jumping incredibly huge fences and and um, and that's what I wanted to do. So it, it was basically one horsepower, which was my original love. Um, of the horsepower and then that slowly graduated onto many many more horsepowers but put into a combustible engine um so yes yeah, so so I, it was completely by um kind of by accident because i spent many years then going into the modeling world after after uh, wanting to be a show jumper and doing all of the juniors i then went into modeling um and then fell upon um, Clarkson one day after doing something called the Gumball Rally and I had just witnessed a, uh, a Koenigsegg at the time, one of the first uh, CCXRs or CCRs or CCXRs I think they are um, and it, it did 240 miles an hour and I was completely blown away that a vehicle, you know, we think we're doing course abiding by the speed limits you know 70 80 90 miles an hour is going really quickly I mean let alone doing 240 so I was blown away I came back to the UK I had to give an award at the um, at the GQ awards and I sat on the table next to Clarkson and so I said you're the car guy oh my god have you heard of a Koenigsegg and he was going yes and I was going I did too I don't know I was like and he said well you love cars why didn't you do my show and I was like so this was it? back in the 90s was it yes yeah. or maybe early 2000s early 2000s early okay. 2000s and and he said come and do my show and I was like mm -hmm. models don't normally kind of watch Top Gear um and um and anyway so I got an invite I went down never raced a car on a track went round 
the track with the Stig, then did the... So the, re the reasonably priced re 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 car. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, and, and, and went straight to the top and beat did, JK. And, and then I went, you know what, I really love this. I could understand the balance of a car, whether that was because of riding yeah, horses. Yeah, it's about balance and, and coordination. Exactly, yeah. and just keeping the car or the horse you know, with all four wheels on, or hoofs on the floor and making sure that you're getting, you know, the best momentum out of a corner and all of these things. So I found kind of racing really just quite easy. I was quite a natural at it. And so I then got my uh, ARDS, I then got my um, racing license, got my international racing license and then ended up racing for Maserati for many years and then did a lot of classic car racing, lots of millimillias. Um, and just fell in love with it. Now that's it. I'm completely hooked. And yeah. and, well, and, and and of course, you, I mean, I do a little bit of racing, and what you do realise it's a mugs game, isn't it? Totally. It's brilliant fun. Yes, I'm very good at racing other people's cars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I need to do more of. But no one's ever asked me. Yes. Um, yeah, look, I don't even know because I, I I do remember you driving the uh, reasonably priced car uh, around yeah. the Top Gear track. Star and a reasonably priced car. Th yeah, that's exactly. right. Yeah. And, I, and I did a little bit of research mm. and then I discovered, and I didn't know if I should mention this. Oh, no, you're is not it true? It, no, me, no, 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 no. <laughs> but is it true that Simon Cowell it was was the I think he you be. he eventually yeah. you were the fastest person for a long time for and years. randomly Simon Cowell yes isn't that weird and I was quite shocked by this and then I found out that he has got a racetrack apparently at his house <laughs> is he? oh well of course he has and um, this is what they told me maybe it was to kind of lessen the blow um, he does like cars I but know yes, he likes cars no apparently he's got a racetrack and he he has go karts and he has and he you know he's quite. Mm. He, he, he liked speed, but I think when he went on the show, there was a lot of practicing, is what I'm saying. Yeah, I I, oh, I'm sure. Because if sure. it was just a natural, he had never been on the track before, I think. Just, that was just his vanity, wasn't it? You know? <sighs> I felt like I'd be very upset. Uh, <laughs> Millimelia, done the Millimelia. That's a four bit of a times. that's a that, yeah. yeah now that's a bucket list event, isn't it? Yeah. And, and the interesting thing about the Millimelia is that it is one of those events which. Mm actually kind of permeates a lot of the industry and the market mm. because if you uh, you can have two very similar cars now if one is millimeter yeah, eligible double M1, and, yeah. and one isn't the eligible car is worth a significantly larger sum of money because yeah. everybody wants to do that event yeah. uh, what did you do the millimeter in I did it for a couple of years with Jaguar and and you're exactly right by saying that because the guys said that every time you start the Millimilia they, they put like a metal tag around um, the which part of the steering I th don't know if it's, it's definitely not in the steering wheel but they put it part of the car and then they stamp it on and it's literally every time you get that stamp of that metal disc literally the car goes up in 10, yeah. 20, 30,000. Yeah. I mean, it's quite extraordinary. Um, and just to have that kudos of a car, it's not about the driver, it's all about the car, the Mille Amelia. Um, so, so um, you know, I was very lucky. I did it with Jaguar and I did an XK120. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I then did it in a BMW, which was the Berlin to Roma. I can't remember what model number it was. This is, I'm dyslexic and terrible at numbers. Um, but uh, yes, I, it, it was the most unbelievable experience. It's been the closest I've ever been to death, quite a few times. Um, and it's something that I love to road race. And it's I think it's where I'm the most natural rather than, you know, kind of doing uh, track, C -c -circuit, track stuff, yeah, circuit yeah. racing. And, it, and, um, it, and, and the, the, the thing about the Mille Amelia and what makes it an amazing experience is, is all the crowds in the street, isn't it? And the waving and, and everybody just, loves it. Because it, the Italians, they're so passionate. The roads are open. So, yeah. you know, there's a lot of variables going on. You know, you really have to be on it. You have to be literally what 
watching everything, which is something that my brain kind of like likes to go to that level. But you know, you are literally driving on roads with families going to schools and things like this, which in some way is complete madness. Yeah. When you're driving these 1940 cars with drum brakes and you know the no seat belt, and you've got normal people going about yeah, you, there. You can't really imagine this happening it's, in the Cotswolds, can no, you? No, I think it's pretty much <laughs> the only place you can do it is in Italy. But you know, the way your brain then computes things. And actually, I was listening to an amazing interview with Nigel Mansell because we're here, because he's selling his um, his two cars. We've got the Red 5 and we've got his, uh, well, his Ferrari here and a few other cars. Um, and, and he was saying that an F1 driver at 150 miles an hour, actually, they their brain recomputes things down to a normal person's brain that we would be thinking 40 miles an hour, but they're doing it at 150 miles an hour. And it's the one way that I suddenly went, you know what, I kind of get it, not that I'm a Formula One driver by any means, but that that you have to really equate things very, very quickly. You do, and, and, and I think one of the most remarkable things about the m current era of Formula One drivers, with all of that tech, and you yeah. look at their steering wheels, and yes. it's, it's a computer that's oh, in front of them. I mean, they're gamers, and, basically. And I don't they, think they're, they are, <laughs> not they're, F1 they're, drivers, they're gamers. They're <laughs> pressing <laughs> buttons, they're twisting knobs, they're, they, they, not only have they got to concentrate on keeping the car on the track at 200 miles an hour, yeah. But they're yeah. actually sort of playing with all of these buttons and switches, oh, which... Um, it's a science. It's, yeah. You it's know. a science. Rather than just getting in, like our wonderful Nigel, just that talent of just... And he was telling this story today of, of just, you know, having a car doing 360s at 190 miles an hour, recreating it, just like that and keeping it going and still setting the fastest lap, you know, things like that. Yeah. We just don't don't see anymore but no. you know, that's that's the era of and and we you know we've we we have been had the privilege of having Nigel out here and and oh. actually and and uh, you've spent a, a good amount of time this this weekend talking to him yeah. and we've been doing that for your YouTube show yes I am. Um, I'm now can, a YouTuber you are, you're a YouTube I'm star now an influencer <laughs> and uh, so tell us a little bit about that because that's quite exciting you you when did you start it and Just in um, lockdown in lockdown yeah in lockdown it was literally um because i think we were all at home for so long and i pretty much exhausted the whole of netflix and yeah. amazon and had you Disney decorated you've done everything everything else i mean honestly there was just nothing else for me to watch <laughs> and then i kind of went into this wonderful world of youtube and i started um, because of my love of cars looking at all the car youtube people out there and you know they were all reviewers there was every single person was either showing some ridiculous car in Dubai that was like oh press this and press them you know or everyone reviews and I was like there's not anyone that's really telling the story of a car the person the builder the designer the owner the 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 collector and that actually what is going on behind the person, mm. you know, mm. or the history of a car. So really you know, getting in deep. Yeah, so, yeah. so because it's, it's, it's a world that when you get bitten, and I think most people that would watch this are, are the ones that have been bitten, that they're so extraordinary. You know, the people behind the cars are so extraordinary. And, you know, often you have a, a complete and utter, you know, unicorn car that I will, that I will do something on. But it's more about, um, you know, we, our kind of ethos is, is if you see it on YouTube, we're not going to do it. So we only really pride ourselves with doing things that are really, really unique and different and special and just put a really tangible way for people to access something that they won't n normally see or yeah so this is where it kind of came from and it's been really successful and i think that's there's a lesson to be learned still there a because baby we're still we haven't even been going a no, year yet but <laughs> it's, it's had a lot of really good traction and i yeah it and really actually has. there's kind of perceived wisdom for a long time that people don't have an attention span you know if you can't mm. entertain somebody in 30 seconds that you know, know they, they switch off and I they and but what what you have actually demonstrated is that if you take a long form approach yes to something and you know long conversations yes. and interviews I know um, people really get into it don't well, they well I was and quite worried because in the world of YouTube it literally needs to be 
five to ten minutes and I was like how can I talk to you know to Zach Brown about his incredible you know private car collection that we had one of our first videos with yeah, 15,000 subscribers or something we've got over a million views but I was like I'm not doing it justice so we kind of went out there just going okay we're going to push a 30 minute video and just see what happens and actually the feedback and the people that have said that have watched it just saying that was the most amazing quickest 30 minutes they've ever had of that yeah. so it was, so it's kind of I think bridging you know your TV terrestrial shows to your very quick short sharp snappy YouTube shows it's kind of filling in this gap that I don't think anyone's filled in before that that I hope is really informative it's really down to earth it's really natural it's very relaxed but and I hope people that I interview feel the same which I think they do so it's kind of like just giving access to the people watching mm. and to the fans mm. of Kiss and a sweet job and subscribers and I love you all and thank you because <laughs> they're amazing. Um, this kind of access that, that you know, we don't normally ever get to see. No, it's, it's fantastic and, and um, I've really, I've watched quite a few of them and they've all been brilliant oh, and, um, and I think you've done some You've been able to do some great stuff out here as well, out, yeah. out in Monaco. So I can't that's wait. something that's something for everyone to look it's forward coming, to. It's coming, coming, it's coming, coming soon, coming soon. <laughs> yeah. um, but thank you very much. I know you've Pleasure. you've got a busy schedule, so thank you for giving us a few I minutes think of your time. Lots are going to be coming up they soon, are, so we need to be. Well, yeah, we probably we're do. On, are we on Lewis? This no, is Lewis's uh, motorbike. Yeah, we're on a motorbike. Yeah, they are going to be coming Lewis's. up soon. So we probably need we probably need we need to get in there. We do need to get in there. So thank you everyone for joining us for another RM Sotheby's Car Show. It's been really good having you here. Thank you to Jody, and we're now going to say goodbye and we're going to go into the auction room to see what happens and I shall see you in the next episode. Thank you. <laughs>